Hello, members of faith. We continue with our spring Bible study, our vocation in Christ. Uh, a little bit of background of where we've been. The first week we began this study uh, by noting that we are where we are because God has called us here. Nothing random or accidental about it. The second week we learned that God intends to serve and bless other people through us. Uh, that that would be God's work that he carries out through us. The third week, uh, we learned that that's not always easy. Uh, that uh, along with our vocation, our roles, our responsibilities, our jobs, uh, comes crosses that we carry as Christians. Uh, specifically, the cross is that struggle between my old self that only wants to serve myself uh, and the new self uh, that loves and cares for others because that's how Christ has loved and cared for me. That's what Christ did with his cross, therefore it's what we do in our crosses. Uh, we learn to willingly and patiently carry them. That was last week. And so today we take this study uh, another couple steps forward, uh, looking at uh, these two things today. All Christians in all vocations are equally righteous before God. And yet God calls each of us to different vocations to serve others differently. And so we'll, we'll begin by way of introduction uh, back to Martin Luther's day, the uh, early 1500s. In Luther's day, the holier your blank, the more certain your blank. Maybe give that a little bit of thought. Uh, the holier your vocation, your job, your role, the more certain your salvation. So there was a, a thought in Luther's day, and it had come long before Luther, uh, within the Catholic Church, that the holier your role, uh, the higher, the more exalted, the more godly your vocation was, then the more certain you could be that you were going to heaven. Uh, and uh, we can certainly and quickly see the, the danger here. Uh, but back then, it, it was a, an accepted thought about everybody's life. Uh, so therefore, the monk, the nun, the priest, the pope, they had certainty of their salvation. Those were the holiest jobs. Uh, to a lesser degree, people in the very noble positions, kings and queens and rulers and dukes uh, and duchesses, uh, they could have some confidence because of their uh, noble and higher standing or status. But all of the common people, the blacksmith, the baker, the mother, the student, uh, let alone those without jobs or without uh, uh, studies, uh, for all of the common and lowly folk, their salvation was nothing but uncertain. I, I, I hope God will love me. I hope God will save me, but I don't know. And the church is only giving me this uncertainty because of my lowly status. Uh, Luther uh, just worked uh, massively, mightily against all of these thoughts by putting God's word back in the hands of the people to say, this is not the case. Uh, and so we look at our present situation, and obviously it's different from Luther's. There isn't a whole lot of that within the church uh, that... Uh, you know, the, the higher your status, the more certain your salvation. But what is similar for you and me? Uh, we still find ourselves thinking that if only uh, I had this or if only I was doing that, then I would, uh, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, we still find ourselves either unsure of our, uh, of our status with God or, uh, or unfulfilled with the vocations that he's given us. Uh, God must really love those people who fill in the blank, but what about me? I don't know. So we still wrestle with the same concepts, even though it's a different circumstance. So let's get into our first point. All Christians in all vocations are equally righteous before God. And we'll start with Romans chapter 3, sort of a longer section. We'll, we'll break it up. Uh, verse 20, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. 
This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And before we get on to the, the very uh, next part of that verse, which is just absolutely vital, we make these points first. Uh, if status was determined by the law, then everybody has the same status. No one will be declared righteousness by the law, by what they do. And at the, at the bottom of that, the same thing. There's no difference between Jew or Gentile, between any person. All have the same status according to the law. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glo glory. All are deserving of God's punishment. Uh, if the status is determined by the gospel, though, uh, Paul says that this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus to all be who believe. Uh, the status is given, and it's for everyone. Uh, and so uh, the passage continues in a glorious way. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. So what, how is that status before God determined? That status of justified, which means not guilty. You think of that courtroom uh, of heaven where God slams down the gavel and says to you and me, not guilty, uh, because Christ was presented as the sacrifice of atonement. He was the evidence in that courtroom for us to be determined justified. And how is that justified status received? By faith. Uh, this is the same status all believers enjoy, all believers of all the different stations in life, of all the, the way the world sees greater or lesser, uh, noble or lowly, uh, all have the exact same exalted status before God because of Jesus. And so this uh, section in Romans 3 ends like this, so where then is boasting? It's excluded. And because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Uh, the same exalted status of all believers given to them through faith in Jesus. There is no difference. Uh, and so uh, thinking of our, uh, of our study here on vocation, what effect do the differences between people and the differences between their vocations have on their status before God? Nothing. There is nothing about any person, not their, their race, their age, their status in life, their wealth, their education, their physical abilities, uh, or any of the jobs or roles or relationships that they have that affect their status before God. Only Christ. Every single Christian is exalted to the same holy and righteous uh, and glorified status because of Jesus. Paul says the same thing in a different way in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Uh, so lumped in there is uh, every single, you know, category that, that we place upon people, categories that God has given, uh, all the things that differentiate us, make us different. In Christ, there's none of them. Uh, we all share the same status as children of God. Uh, a way of illustrating what we just heard, uh, I'm sure you've heard of and seen schools that uh, have their students wear uh, uniforms. Uh, and what would be some of the blessings or benefit that come from school uniforms? Uh, I'm sure there are many, uh, but just one would be that uh, all of the students are put on an equal playing field, at least when it comes to their dress and their attire. Uh, there isn't the, the haves or the have-nots. Uh, there isn't the, the higher, higher status and lower status of those based on, on the children's clothing. 
that is uh, that part of it is eliminated by the uniforms. Um, Paul is saying that in baptism, uh, all of our earthly differences are all covered in Christ, and that same exalted status is given to all believers, kind of like a uniform, the uniform being Jesus. Uh, and so here's a question. Is Paul saying then that uh, all of our roles and our relationships and our jobs and our vocations, uh, they're all the same? Is, is that the point Paul is making? No, they are not the same. Uh, but Paul's not even talking about any of those things. The only relationship that Paul is talking about is your relationship with God. That's it. And in that relationship, our roles, our relationships, our jobs, our vocations have nothing to do with it. Only Jesus has anything to do with that relationship. Uh, nothing about us. To illustrate it in a way would be like this. That vertical relationship between God and me. Uh, whereas I brought sin to the table, God took my sin away through the cross of his son. And that's called grace. And that's called justification, being declared not guilty, uh, which is the, the gospel message which we receive by faith. All of that, uh, these are the only things on the table. It is only Christ and all that God has done for me. That's, that's it. It's only on the horizontal table on the horizontal uh, between me and other people uh, that we, we get the things like the vocations and the, the variety of roles and relationships. Uh, we would call these the, the realm of good works and sanctification, uh, where the law serves us uh, by telling us what is God-pleasing and faithful living to do those things. That's on the, the horizontal plane, uh, but none of it has anything to do with how we came to have the status we have uh, with God, that declared righteous, that perfectly holy in God's eyes, that only came through the vertical relationship, <clears throat> which is what Jesus accomplished. Luther says it this way, and recall what we said about his uh, time and what uh, the church was teaching them about the holiest jobs, uh, and therefore there, there's the certainty for your salvation uh, Luther said this, the monastery and all these other man-made holy ways to serve God produced nothing but an accursed life. For they never produced the glorious comfort that only Christ can give and that only Christians can have. Formerly, I did not understand this. I did not know what a Christian life really was. Now I can rejoice that everything I do by faith is pleasing to God, for I am his child. And again, think of the, the visual that we just saw. Uh, God made me his child. He did that through Christ. And now I know that everything I do is pleasing to him because that's who he made me. Not the other way around. Not that, that all that I do makes me God's child. Not that all that I do gives me that, that comfort uh, so that my, my conscience can be soothed. No, only Christ can give that. And now we know who we really are. And that's our first point. All Christians in all vocations are equally righteous before God. Uh, we noted on Sunday in the introduction to this study that uh, knowing this uh, relieves us of I've got to prove myself to God or I'm always comparing myself to others. There's no need for it. God tells me who I am, who he's made me. I don't have to prove anything to him and I don't have to prove or compare myself to anybody else. Uh, because in Christ, I know who I am. Our second point now, uh, we had the equality before God because of Christ, but now we have a variety of vocations. God calls each of us to different vocations to serve others differently. Here's a little uh, example. Imagine if a baseball team was made up entirely of catchers. Who would pitch the ball? Uh, who would be the manager? Who who would be the, uh, you fill in the blank. Uh, imagine an orchestra made up entirely of tuba players. Uh, you might like the sound of a tuba, but uh, the whole orchestra, uh, probably not the best uh, way to go. Uh, I think we clearly see the point that God builds in uh, variety and a difference of roles into our lives. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 puts this really well. This is sort of a longer text, but the point uh, is clear. Even so, uh, for whatever point he made up to this point, 
The body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Uh, the context here is that the uh, the Corinthian church, the believers in the city of Corinth, they had all kinds of strengths, all kinds of gifts, and they and they knew it. They were uh, pretty proud about it. But they had not learned how to love one another with those gifts, with those strengths. They thought that they could use them for themselves uh, in whatever way they thought. Uh, they had not learned the relationship between the body parts. And that's exactly what Paul explains to them. Uh, so why does God make us different or give us different roles? Uh, from the example of the body Paul just gave, uh, because there is need. There is need amongst the body of Christ. And there is need just between all people throughout the world. We've talked about that pretty, pretty thoroughly so far in this study. There is just simply nonstop need <clears throat> uh, amongst human beings. Uh, within the church, we get to see the, the connection that we have because of Christ. But the need continues even beyond that. And so God has made us different and given us different roles uh, to provide for those needs, the needs of others. Uh, whose interest or whose benefit do the various parts of the body serve? Does the eye serve itself? Does the ear serve itself? Uh, of course not. Those parts serve the rest of the body. Uh, they serve the other parts. Uh, and so to, to think of the roles we've been given, the different and variety of, of roles, the greater or the lesser ones, uh, we see we see that whatever it is, the purpose is for others, just as we've made that point uh, consistently throughout this study. What are some pitfalls or temptations in this realm of being a body part amongst other different parts? Uh, well, we very easily and sometimes quickly uh, just become envious or, or jealous or, or unsatisfied with our own uh, lot in life. Or, or, or then easily despairing uh, of our own worth or value. Uh, when, uh, when we see in the body, uh, each has been, been given a different role for God's glorious pur purpose. Uh, the text continues uh, at the end of chapter 12 and into 13. Uh, and this, um, well, we'll get there when we get to 13. Right now, the end of chapter 12, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in other languages? Do all interpret? Now I tell you, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Uh, this sets up, uh, first of all, the point, the, the second point of this Bible study, that uh, God gives different Christians different vocations, different gifts, different skills. That's exactly what Paul just said here. But it sets up now chapter 13. And I'm sure you are familiar with uh, chapter 13. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it at countless weddings. Uh, and it's a, a text that gets used for weddings because of the word love. But notice how the context really isn't uh, 
just a marriage, although a marriage is certainly included, but it's every relationship. It's every setting where Christians get to use the gifts God has given them. That could be the church. It could be the home. It, it is certainly your, your job or your career or, or your position in the community, whether, again, great or small. In any of these ways, uh, Paul is saying you all have gifts, you all have roles, responsibilities, and here's how we go about uh, understanding what we are to do. Um, this is where the context of this text comes from. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. And so his point there is, uh, the the greater gifts, the the higher the uh, ability, um, the the greater the importance in the eyes of the world. But if it's not done out of love for another person, uh, it, it's nothing but a, a noise or uh, or some meaningless thing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It, it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Uh, so when it comes to all of the gifts we've been given and how we use them, this is the most excellent way. Paul goes on, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it'll pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, uh, but when completeness comes, uh, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And so the these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Uh, what is the most excellent way to understand our different roles and the variety of vocations we have and that exist in the world? It's that they are given to us to love others. Uh, we've made this point in different ways so far, uh, but now we see it in this way. The variety is for a variety of love. The differences is for different ways to love. Um, it is not the, the fact that one has a, a greater or a lesser role or a greater or a lesser gift. The, the point is how they use them to love one another. Uh, this, is the, this is the point uh, that we make here in our vocations. God has given them to us so that he can love other people and he does it through us. Evaluate this. Uh, someone might say, well, those are not my gifts. Uh, you think of your relationship with your neighbors. Well, I'm not the most outgoing person. Or you think of help within the home. Well, my husband or my wife is better at that. Those really are not my gifts. Or service within the church. There's all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of ways to help and carry out the ministry. Well, uh, those are not my gifts. Somebody else can do it. Or tasks within your job or your career. Uh, not my gifts. I don't have. I shouldn't have to do that. And there certainly is a lot of truth in that. Uh, it is a good and healthy thing to recognize where your skills are and where they are not. Yet, uh, do we often use this as just simply an excuse? Um, professor Cherney, we've heard from him before in this study, a uh, professor at the seminary, he said it this way, uh, a wise old pastor once told me Christians tend to veer into the ditch when they equate their own spiritual gifts with whatever they happen to enjoy doing. It's easy, therefore, to excuse themselves from whatever thankless or unpleasant task by simply declaring, that's not my gifts. And so while it very well may be true uh, that your gifts are not in socializing with your neighbors, and yet, could it be that it's the Lord's will to strengthen you where your gifts are not? in having a relationship with your neighbor, that you'd be able to serve him in, in, or her in whatever way. Uh, so not my gifts is not 
uh, uh, the end of the matter. In helping within the home and, and thinking of husband and wife or parents and children, uh, maybe it is the very thing that is not your gift that is a way of loving the other person by doing it. Service in the church, uh, the, the opportunities abound. Uh, and, and, and let's say that your gift is not in a certain area. Perhaps your gift is in finding and encouraging someone who is gifted in that way. So simply not a wiping of the hands, not my gifts, not my worry, uh, but rather, how can I help? How can I get someone into that position that would serve uh, the church in, in, a, in a good way? Uh, and the same within your job and in your career. Um, if, if it isn't your gift to do something, maybe the Lord would have you strengthen that area uh, of your gifts or to help and encourage to find someone who, who can do it. You see, in all of those ways, it's love that determines the way forward, not uh, not just my enjoyment or my convenience or my preference, but love. Uh, and so our two points today, uh, all Christians in all vocations are equally righteous before God, yet God calls each of us to different vocations to serve others differently. And if we don't understand the first one, if we aren't filled with the joy that comes from knowing I have uh, I have the status of righteous before God, then we won't understand the second. Uh, we won't uh, see all of these things in that way. Uh, in other words, if we're not filled or motivated by the gospel, we're never going to see anything in life as it really is. Um, husbands and wives will not look at each other uh, in the way that the Lord has given them, uh, or, or the roles we have within our family or, or our church or our job or our neighborhood or community. Uh, if it isn't the gospel that is the breath that we breathe in and out, uh, then, then nothing will be as it, as it should be or as it is. Um, everything else becomes something that it, it shouldn't be, a boast about ourselves or a burden that we want to avoid. Uh, but rather, uh, just like the diagram, we see first of all that, that vertical, this is who I am. This is what God has done for me. This is what God calls me. This is what he has made me. And now we look horizontally at each other at the variety God has given us and the ways we get to love one another. We heard this quote on Sunday from Mark Paustian, a professor at MLC in New Ulm. Uh, and I just want to come back to it again and close on it today. Um, this is just really wonderful to think about. Every day is like Christmas for God. A thousand opportunities are in front of each believer each day, all of which conform to God's law. And by God's mercy, the choice is between good and good. You choose one option knowing it would not have been a sin to choose another. So this is that horizontal, right? That back and forth and all the variety and different roles and gifts and circumstances we find ourselves in. We get to choose uh, how to love God and love one another uh, in, in whatever ways make sense for the gifts we have or the gifts we need to get better at, uh, whatever the case may be. And then he says, it's like entering a department store, going up to a certain shelf in a certain area until you're Eyes fall on the item that seizes your gaze, the one you select just for your father. You crawl up into his lap. He peels off the wrapping and exclaims, oh, what a delight. Uh, this is God's grace. Uh, now here comes the vertical uh, portion of that uh, image we had before. Because I am God's child, because that's who he made me. Now all of my horizontal dealings, uh, I know that the, uh, my father is pleased with them because he's made me his child. And I get to know that. And I get to live like I know that. Uh, and then uh, Professor Paustian takes it just one beautiful step further to say uh, that, it, that all of this is a mystery. For what you chose for him is what he chose for you. Uh, the ways in which we serve and praise the Lord and, and help and benefit and love one another, uh, it's, it's the Lord who has chosen all of that for us. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful concept. Every Christian enjoys the same perfect status before God. God places each Christian into different vocations to love others differently. That's our conclusion. And so finally, a passage to close on. Uh, Psalm 131, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters too wonderful for me. But I have, cl but I have calmed and quieted myself. Like a weaned child, I am content. Put your hope in the Lord both now and forever. And let's pray. 
Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, we thank and praise you uh, that we get to know uh, this side of heaven. We get to know uh, just exactly who we are. Uh, we are your uh, beloved children. Uh, you have made us children of, your, of our Heavenly Father because you came to us uh, to take away the stain and the barrier and the blockade of sin uh, so that there would be nothing standing between us and our Heavenly Father. Uh, and so knowing who we are with, with you because of you, uh, now we know who we are to the people in our lives. Uh, the opportunities abound uh, for us to serve and help one another, which is your will in our lives. And so give us the strength to do it. Fill our, the, the lungs of our soul, fill them with the good news of our salvation. And then place us back into our vocations uh, to serve one another. We thank you for all of these opportunities in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you for uh, watching this video, for joining in the Bible study. We've got one more week ahead of us. Next week will be the last uh, of these uh, discussions and studies on our vocation in Christ. Uh, we'll talk to you then. Bye now.